Okay, maybe we can start now. Okay, so welcome everybody to the webinar series of Society of Neuroscience of Africa. It's our pleasure uh, today to have Dr. Mohammed Abdel Haq. So he comes from Egypt and he has a wide area of expertise. So he did his bachelor first in electrical engineering in Alexandria University. And then he did his master in Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And later he did his PhD in Kyoto University with Dr. Kamitani where he worked on top-down modulation in human visual cortex, uh, what he will talk about today. And actually I first, uh, and he now he currently works as a postdoc in Washington University in St. Louis, where he actually applies machine learning to healthcare problems, which is a very interesting topic as well. Uh, I first knew him actually in Neuromatch Academy, where he was uh, lead uh, TA for computational neuroscientist, and he showed his, uh, expertise in explaining concepts. So I'm pretty sure today's lecture would be very interesting. Uh, so yeah, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Am. And Hello, maybe everyone. just to, just one okay. thing quickly, like uh, please, uh, during the talk, you can all put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, you can see it on the, down, on the bottom part of the screen and we will address the questions later after the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Am. Uh, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, basically how the brain is robust is in comparison to artificial neural networks. So although Amber has already given some introduction. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I just had this slide where <laughs> uh, I'm giving my academic background. So basically, I started as an electrical engineer in Alexandria University. Uh, at that time, I got really interested in the idea of brain computer interfacing, where I was really fascinated that you can actually talk to the brain and read the mind in general. Uh, so I got into the business of brain computer interfacing. And then I thought after I graduated, I wanted to know more about the brain. So I need to study more on the biology. So I got into my master's uh, degree. I got into neuroscience where I did lab work with the nematodes, uh, nervous system. So that's a very uh, computationally interesting problem since their brain is very simple. So it's kind of tractable to try to do modeling on it. Uh, later, I got even more interested actually in the brain and then I managed to get into the lab that I wanted to join because it did what I liked, which was mind reading or brain decoding. Uh, so that's what I'm also going to be uh, talking about is mainly work from uh, Kyoto University uh, PhD work and some work later also that was done with uh, in collaboration with Kyoto University Hospital. Uh, so, as I said, I got into the, I got interested into the idea of uh, the deep neural networks. So, you, in 2012, the deep neural networks, they start, they basically broke all of the records of uh, image recognition technology. So, there is, uh, they basically uh, overtook every other technology that existed at the time. However, at the same time, they found that those deep neural networks that were used for image recognition, they had some interesting properties that you could actually uh, just alter the images very slightly that it appears to us very similar. But for the deep neural networks, they actually make them do a big mistake. So for example, in this bus image in the bottom, if we, the one on the left is classified by a neural network as a school bus, and then the one on the right is, was classified as like 99% something else. I remember it was penguin or something like that. And basically the difference between the two images is what we can see in the middle. So for us, the human eye, those images look exactly the same, but for a neural network, it gets really uh, fooled by this kind of uh, images. So there was one really interested, interesting article that got me interested in this idea, which is that this is kind of the machine version of visual illusions. So I wanted, to, I wanted to think to see, okay, so what actually those illusions look like in those machines and how, do, how are they different from the ones that we have in the brain? And why is our brain much better at those kind of uh, robustness against uh, those uh, changes to the image? Uh, so basically, I started doing an experiment 
which is, okay, let's, instead of looking at, uh, like trying to break the neural networks, let's just do some very simple alterations to the image. So we can see this image of a cat and the neural network is uh, quite good at recognizing that this image representing a cat. But let's see what happens after I start blurring that image gradually. So as the blurring increases, we can see that very quickly the neural network starts to uh, make mistakes of how to see actually this image. And of course, after the image gets sufficiently blurred, it becomes even uh, not visible to the human eyes as well. Uh, so the question is now, how does this actually compare to a human performance? So I did the same experiment, but of course I'm showing the bl most blurred image first uh, until the least blurred. And at the time I tested it uh, with a couple of my lab members. So first let's see, so this is the results from the neural network. We can see at the 0% it's classifying correctly at 6% blurred, the only cat feature is in fourth place. And as we see 12, 25 and 40%, the cat category disappears completely. And here are those three thick lines represent the main uh, three categories that are top here. Uh, so I did it this same experiment where I was showing the, the most blurred and then until the image most uh, clears up. And then I asked every lab member, okay, so can you tell me what you can see? Or like whenever you recognize something, let me know. And then I waited for them to say the word cat. And then I recorded that. Uh, and those are the results that I got. So mainly only one participant performed worse than a neural network while all of the other four performed much better. And one of them even recognized this image at like something that looks like this 40% uh, blurred, which I'm not sure how he did it, but it, it just happened. <laughs> um, yeah, so the question that got raised at the time was like, what makes our brain so special in comparison to those artificial neural networks? So our brain has this really interesting, uh, like phenomenon or property where it starts to complete information or add up some new information to the image based on our already stored representation or stored knowledge of what those objects are. So we can see like this cat and uh, which is hiding and then this dog, which is sort of camouflaged into the background. So the brain can add some information that looks something like this where try to uh, make the dog stand out from the background and complete the, inf the what's missing in the cat's image because we already know how a cat looks like. So the question is how this gets done. So if we start looking at how the brain first uh, processes information, so the, in the information comes first from the eye and then it travels back to the to the back of the head, basically to the lower visual cortex, where you have uh, areas that process only edges or basically lower level uh, visual features like edges or contrast, things like that. So that happens in this lower visual areas like B1 and B2 and B3. And as the processing goes forward, those visual features become more complex. So basically the edges first, and then it becomes objects or shapes. And then as we go deeper into the higher visual cortex, we can see areas like the lateral occipital complex and FFA and PPA, where uh, they, are, they are sensitive to object, complete objects like that we can recognize or human faces or uh, scene images as well. So that happens through this ventral pathway inside of the human brain. However, there is also another pathway that is at play in the human brain, which is the top down. So basically what happens is that the higher visual cortex also has connections to the lower visual areas. So all of these areas are really highly interconnected, which makes it's possible that you can process an image and then go back and also project what you know in order to complete this information. So the question is, how does this also compare to the artificial neural networks? So if we look at an example, which is uh, AlexNet, one of the most basic uh, artificial neural networks it was developed in 2012. So AlexNet is composed of eight layers of uh, that are stacked on top of each other. 
So here we can see the, so CNN1 is the most shallow layer or the layer that is most close to the image space. And CNN8 is the one that is uh, most close to, uh, or the deepest or the one that is closest to the classification. So we can see that CNN1 and CNN2, they are responding to very simple uh, things. So we can see some Gabor-like uh, filters here. And some, uh, so these are, uh, would correspond to edge detections. And we can see some very simple, uh, like something that's not really meaningful in those early layers. But as we go deeper, we can see, for example, in CNN8, the leftmost image is an image of a bird. And then the one in the, at the, uh, the most right is a penguin and the one to the right to it is a spider. So it's basically, it's responding to the categories that are, uh, that the classification categories that it's trying to classify in the AlexNet. So it has a very similar uh, hierarchy to the human brain where it also processes very low level information first and then it goes progressively until uh, it goes very uh, high level information. But on the other hand, we can see that those neural networks are only feed forward. So they don't have this feedback. Uh, so they don't have those feedback connections that might be the reason why the human uh, brain is uh, more robust. Uh, so to also talk about the similarities between the human brain and uh, the deep neural network. So this was a study uh, that was done earlier uh, also in my lab. And the, what, what happens is that they make decoders that basically uh, reflect from the brain activity that is measured through functional magnetic resonance imaging. And it tries to decode the features that are coming out from the neural networks. So for example, if we look at AlexNet here, if we go back, then at each layer, you can get the output of each layer. So those can be feature vectors, like the ones on the right here. And then uh, we try to, they try to uh, decode the, those patterns from the brain data directly. And an interesting thing is that they found that the lower visual areas in the human brain, like V1 and V2 and V3, better decoded the information that is coming out of the shallow uh, layers like CNN2, CNN3, and CNN4. And as you go deeper in the neural networks, we find that deeper or higher visual cortical areas, they start to take over and become better at predicting uh, the outputs. So it, it, this study shows basically there's the very, the similarity in homology between the human brain and the artificial deep neural network. But that's not what I'm looking at. So I'm looking at the difference. So the difference here is that the human brain has this pure bottom up where each input from previous layer is fed into the upper layer and so on. While the other, while the brain is more, very highly connected. So we have this feed forward drive, but we also have feedback that is coming from deeper areas and also some recurrence that is happening in the same layer. So in this, uh, work, we don't uh, differentiate between recurrence and feedback. So we consider both of those two components are the top down modulation. So there are previous studies that did talk about this idea of how the brain uh, generates this uh, top down images. So one idea is that there are two pathways that are happening in the brain. One is very fast that only processes the images very quickly, goes to frontal cortex of the brain and then projects back to the higher visual areas in the fusiform gyrus. And it gives sort of a, a possible uh, classification targets so that it can process, uh, improve the representations that are coming from the early visual areas. Uh, so there are also two ways that are trying to explain how this uh, top-down integration is happening. So to one way is that the top-down integration is causing a sharpening of the, of the neural representation of those images. So basically, if you have a blurred image, then the, the sharpened representations are basically representations that correspond to a sharper image or a not less blurred image. While at the same time, there is another uh, idea which is said that there is a dampening effect where what the input is basically subtracted from 
what's predicted. So that's the idea of a prediction error. And then the difference is the one that is actually uh, gets processed. So the question that I was, I'm trying to pose here is how does this top-down pathway affect the neural representation? So I'm trying to think about the idea, does it actually do a sharpening or does it just subtract the error and what is exactly happening inside of the brain in order to improve those representations? So I ran this experiment where basically we present blurred images to uh, the subjects. So we had five subjects and, oops, sorry, I have to play the video. Yeah, so inside of the fMRI scanner, the subjects saw those images. So this is a very blurred image. And then after eight seconds of watching it, the image starts to get clearer. And the subject is trying to recognize what's in the image. And they also have a microphone in front of them to tell what they are seeing. So as we can see, the image starts to get clearer by time. And in the end, they will see uh, the last image, which is the non-blurred image. So they, we had four different levels of blurring. 25% uh, represents like the most blurred. So here, for example, and then the 0% represent to the least blurred. So it went like 25, 12, 6% and 0%. So those are the four levels of blurring. Uh, yeah, and on another run, we also presented 1000 images, non-blurred images. So those are ones to train the decoder. So similar to the way that um, the previous paper by Horikawa and Kamitani that I presented earlier. So what happens is that we present those non-blurred images and then we have the fMRI activity and we present the same image into the deep neural network and then we get the DNA, the true DNN activations from each layer. And what we try is that we try to fit, for example, a, for each one unit in here, let me actually annotate. So yeah, for example, this one, we put that as the Y uh, hat and then all of the fMRI activity, of course, from different, we divide into different regions is the X here. And then what we do is that we try to train those weights uh, to, ma to minimize the difference between this Y uh, bar and the Y hat, uh, which is the true DNN activation and the predicted ones uh, from the DNN. Yeah, so then after we train this decoder, we, we, pres we, put, we input the blurred images into the decoder. And then we have this decoded DNN feature. So we get the stimulus image, the brain activity is recorded, and then we already have the trained decoder, and then we have those features. So if the brain is behaving uh, purely in a feed-forward manner, then we would expect that there would be a high correlation between those decoded DNN features and the DNN features corresponding to presenting the same image to the DNN. But if the brain is actually sharpening the image or sharpening the neural representations, then we expect the correlation to be more uh, similar to that of the original non-blurred images. So we calculate those two correlations, which is like uh, in order to compare those two, and the first result that we get is that if we look at the figure here, so that's an example from images uh, for uh, data decoded from areas from the whole visual cortex. So basically an aggregate of the lower and the higher visual cortex. And this is uh, layer uh, six of AlexNet and for one subject. So we find that there is relative tendency to be closer to the RO, which is the uh, features corresponding to the actual image as opposed to the stimulus image, which is the one that is actually presented. And if we subtract between those two, then we find that there is a net uh, positive delta R, which is the difference between RO and RS uh, in favor of the uh, non-blurred images until, except at the high level of blurring, which is basically it's... Uh, it's really difficult to actually know what's the image, what's in the image to uh, project any information. 
the problem with this is that this measure doesn't really tell us, okay, uh, is it doing sharpening or is it do not doing sharpening? Because there is a base level of correlation be just because the images look the same. So we wanted to create something that uh, tells us, okay, this is the baseline, like the zero is just the pure feed forward that is done by the DNN. So we improved this. Um, we started to make a simulated uh, features that would simulate the behavior of only the feed forward. So what happens is that we created this noise match DNN feature. So these are features that are coming from the DNN, but basically they just, we added noise to them to match the behavior of the fMRI scanner. So they are coming from a purely feed forward uh, model that, but it has, it matches the power of the noise that is happening inside of the fMRI scan. And then we calculated both those RO and RS. And then if we subtract those correlations, then we can actually find the difference that is uh, corresponding to the top-down effect. So this is how it looked like. So we have, uh, this is so similar to the first scatter plot. We have the decoded RO and RS, and then we also have the noise matched RO and RS. If we subtract those, then we get delta R and delta R for the noise. And then if we subtract those from each other, then we get feature gain or what we call feature gain, which is <clears throat> corresponds to basically the I, um, how much the top-down effect is making the image or the neural representation closer to that of the original image. So a more positive feature gain means that the image is more sharpened. So if we look at the feature gain from data that is decoded from the uh, whole of the visual cortex, we can see that there is a net positive feature gain and it increases by the decrease of the blur level, which makes sense because you're closer to the original image and then there is more information that you can actually uh, add. But that's only for the lower visual area or the lower layers. While if we look at the higher layers, then we can see that it drops after the 12% level, which we could say that because those last few layers are just they don't really, uh, they process really high level information. So once you already know the category of the object, there is not much to add information to add at this level. While if you go to the shallower layers, you want to add more resolution or more details like, you know, the patterns or so on, because this is what those layers actually process. Uh, the other thing is that in this experiment, we also conducted two sets, one with no prior information. So basically just any image you're going to be seeing. And another one where we told the subject you're going to see an image that is composed of one of five categories. So the subjects, instead of just haphazardly searching over their whole knowledge space, <clears throat> they can only select one of five categories in the other experiment. And we found that this prior is also actually giving, uh, is boosting the feature gain uh, by adding this category prior. And it happened over like all of different visual areas. And also it's happening over uh, all different levels of processing as well. And these results were actually, they did pass the significance level over uh, all of the layers. Um, yeah, so this is what we found in the brain. What we found is basically that the brain is sharpening the information. So what if we try to add that into the model? Like, what, would we be able to see a similar behavior that is happening inside of the computational model as, <clears throat> as what's happening in the brain? So we built, so this is a very simple toy model in here. And we have a feed forward model, which create, we created from like, it only contains seven layers. And then we added a different model, which is a recurrent and it has only one level of recurrence. So it just recurs one time and then it gives the output. And another model, which also adds a top down where one layer gives information to the next, to the previous layer as well. Um, so in this model, we, did two things. Uh, so because of the difference in the number of parameters, it's natural that those models should 
and behave better. So to stop that from, uh, like for, to decrease the amount of this confounding factor, <clears throat> we train the feed forward model first. And then after that, we fixed the weights of the feed forward uh, layers. And then we added the recurrence and then we trained the model. But so of course the feed forward uh, weights are going to be fixed. They're not going to change even in the second layer. Only those green uh, arrows are the ones that are being trained. And then after that, we added the top down. <clears throat> uh, we added the top down weights and also we only trained those. <clears throat> the interesting thing also is that given our human experiences, we only see normal images. We don't really see a lot of degraded images. So we only train those networks with intact images, no blurring, nothing. And then I tested on the same images that we actually presented in the, um, uh, in the experiment. And the interesting thing is that, so this is the result of the test loss. So basically the lower is the better because there's less difference between the actual uh, result. And interesting part is that at 0%, so no blur and very weak blur, there is no much difference between the feed forward and the recurrent and top down. But as we go to a higher level, like 12%, 25%, we find that <clears throat> the the effect of recurrence and top-down is actually kicking in, even though no blurred were uh, included in the training data set. So this kind of very toy model is actually performing very well. And then I wanted to see, okay, so how does this compare to the feature gain model inside of the brain? So same thing, uh, same experiment, but instead of putting noise match features, I just put the feed forward model layers because there is no noise in this condition. We're comparing DNNs with each other. And interestingly, we find this <clears throat> positive, net positive feature gain where we can see recurrent and top down model are uh, making the image more closer to the actual image rather than the blurred image. And, <clears throat> but the discrepancy we found is that the level, the trend is opposite with the blur level as compared to the human behavior, which was interesting. This could be some cognitive, um, cognitive thing that is happening inside of the brain that just stops it whenever it's futile to add any information. Another interesting thing is that I tested also Mooney images. So those Mooney images are just black and white. And I remember when I put those to the DNN, they just break, they fail, they cannot do anything with them. <clears throat> and it's also very interesting that the test loss is much lower for the recurrent and top-down layers for those kind of images. And they also exhibit sharpening where they have a positive net uh, feature gain. And this was shown also recently by another study that was presented in this year, NeurIPS, uh, from uh, Anita Anandkumar's lab, where uh, adding recurrence would actually uh, sharpen the images, as we can see in this D part. So that's the original image, and those are the ones that corrupted that they added to the neural network, and then <clears throat> the resulting images from those. So this one had both a classification and the generation model. Uh, implemented inside of them. Yeah, so then another, so then I actually, we had a talk with the psychiatry department in Kyoto University Hospital, which were nearby. And they were telling us about this idea that there is an imbalance in schizophrenia between the bottom up and the top down connections that are <clears throat> inside of the brain. But uh, it was still unknown. There is two hypotheses, one that says that uh, there is an excess of top-down modulation where basically the internal thoughts are manifested inside of the lower layer that leads to hallucinations. And there is another hypothesis that says, no, the input is just over because of excess bottom-up. <laughs> then there is an over-expression or over-interpretation of whatever stimulus that leads to hallucinations. So they thought that yeah, our way, our method is a very good candidate to test this hypothesis. So we did the exact same uh, experiment, but with uh, two different groups for schizophrenia and controls. And 
we basically what we found is that so this is still preliminary results we're still working on that uh, but we found that the schizophrenia patients, they basically showed a higher top-down effect than the controls. Another thing is that we found that the feature gain in general was, uh, was an interesting part where we found feature gain was lower in even the control group, but that could probably be a difference in demographics because uh, in the second experiment, subjects were older and also uh, they were uh, more naive than our previous subjects who were uh, more used to the fMRI experiments. But we also, if when we looked at differences between the lower visual cortex and higher visual cortex, we found that this higher feature gain is much more pronounced in the lower visual cortex, especially in the shallower layers, um, while higher visual cortex, it does not show that same tendency. So we were thinking that could be a uh, that that those areas are more affected by this kind of uh, phenomenon. But yeah, I cannot, I don't want to give any more information about that because this is still work in progress. So yeah, hopefully soon we would be having a much more elaborate picture of that result. Yeah, so that takes me to the end of my talk. So to summarize, Basically, we using the feature gain analysis, we found that the visual cortex sharpens the neural representations of the blurred images. And the addition of recurrence and top-down uh, is to feed-forward models of vision can induce the same sharpening behavior. And we can also say that uh, preliminary results, they show slightly higher top-down effect because of schizophrenia. Yeah, so at the end, I would like to thank all the members of uh, the Kamitani lab in both Kyoto University and ATR, and also members of Takahashi lab in Kyoto University Hospital, and all of the members of the, uh, for the technical staff of the fMRI scanners in the Kokoro Research Center in Kyoto University and Kyoto University Hospital, and of course, all of the funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Muhammad. It was a really interesting talk. Uh, yeah, so as we wait for other people's questions, I might have a question. So maybe actually two questions. So one would be technical and one would be more general. So first, the technical part, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I got it right, like this noise match it uh, features. Uh, I, can, can you go back to the slide and maybe like elaborate more on how, how this makes a difference when you add this noise? Uh, yeah, I actually had a slide that explains this in more details, but I, uh, I didn't include it because uh, ex experiments with other people, it confused them even more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as far as I understand it, okay, you can go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically yeah, my so, understanding is go. Huh. Yeah, yeah, you go. So just yeah, my understanding is that you decode you have this decoded DNN features that you decode from the fMRI and you compare it to uh, what DNN would output from uh, like a original image or from uh, uh, like a like as a stimulus image which is blurred. And you're trying to here to mimic the noise that exists in fMRI. Is this what you're doing? Yes. So uh, let me go back to this slide because it tells like the motivation that we're trying to reach here. So imagine that we have one point that RO is, or this delta R decode is zero. So that means that just RO is equal to RS. So that doesn't really mm -hmm. gives us any meaningful information. So what we wanted to do is that we wanted to create a baseline of no top-down component. So we don't mm -hmm. have that in the human brain. So we needed to get that from somewhere else. So we thought that the DNN is what we can actually use for that. So, but the DNN features, if we try to compute directly, then uh, this component, uh, like, uh, where's the annotation? Yeah, so those noise match features, they come originally from those uh, stimulus image features because they correspond to the same image. So basically, if we don't do any noise matching, then this is going to be very high. 
this correlation is going to be very high mm -hmm. just because they are similar to each other. Um, while those fMRI activity, because of the high noise in fMRI itself, then those values are in the ranges of, actually, we can see it in the previous slide. Yeah, so we can see that the values range from zero or sometimes even negative correlation to 0.5. So in order to be able to compare those effectively, we needed to simulate the effect of the fMRI noise in order to be able to look at them more effectively. So we added basically uh, Gaussian noise to the okay. DNN features until we found a matching level. So that was calculated through uh, original images, not stimulus, uh, not, not blurred images. Mm -hmm. So okay. that those images are because they don't have any top down effect. So we can only, or at least not top down effect because of the image degradation, because of course there is top down happening all the time. Yeah. Okay. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we get this question first. So we have a question. Uh, how much can image segmentation improve the sharpening procedure? It seems to me if we can work out the boundaries on blurry images, something I have been uh, using to uh, topological tools to, to do, could help out with sharpening. Yeah, so that could, uh, yeah, that could be uh, like once you segment the image, of course, that would improve the sharpening procedure. But the point is that probably the sharpening procedures already helps in also doing the image segmentation. So I think um, saying that, yeah, the image segmentation is kind of a, it's not really uh, a separate uh, procedure from the sharpening itself. Maybe you can say prior information can be helpful, like where is the location of the object in the image, then you, are, you don't have to search over the whole image space but you can only focus on, you focus your attention. And we know already that attention already uh, creates uh, some sort of a top-down modulation as well, especially with uh, that is, uh, has been shown several by several studies to cause, induce more sharpening. So yeah, you can think of in this condition, image segmentation can act as a prior as well. And actually I, like you, I think you mentioned in the talk that uh, the feature gain is higher in lower areas, right? Uh, not exactly, no. I remember, yeah, they were Maybe with the schizophrenia? Okay. Oh yeah, for schizophrenia, the, the schizophrenia is, is higher than controls and that is visible in the lower layers. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking like if, if there would be like because of the choice of blurring imaging, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the receptive field of the visual cortex is actually like the visual area would actually play a role here. Like, for example, if you have a high blurring, the, the early layers that, uh, or early areas that have like very low receptive fields would be seeing just noise, but like Early, like uh, later areas that have like a large receptive field, so you could be seeing more of like low frequency signal, basically, which is like, mm -hmm. yeah, it looks like a cat, but so I like, but I think you did yeah. what, what, like, but also you, you used the whole, uh, like the whole data, like the whole uh, data from, from all visual cortices in the decoding, right? Like you did not differentiate between oh, areas. We did actually. You, if you look, so this, uh, I omitted the figure which uh, showed different visual areas because I thought it will be shown in this category versus uh, with no prior versus category prior. But yeah, it, in general, there was a net positive feature gain and it also had the similar homology where uh, the higher visual areas were uh, showing higher feature gain. So it all depends on uh, what you're looking at what you're looking for but yeah in the if we look at lower visual areas and lower layers then yeah we still have a net positive feature gain coming out from v1 v2 and v3 as well uh, and 
And there is a specific reason for choosing blurring, like, because blurring, like, like, I think you mentioned this already, like blurring is not something that we see naturally, but there are other things, like for example, occlusion, this happens more naturally or, or it's just easier to control also experimentally, I guess. Well, we actually, in the preliminary experiment, we did occlusion. But then when we looked at the literature, we found that almost everyone did occlusion. <laughs> <laughs> so there was not much to add at that point. Currently, we're actually looking at the Mooney images. So we have data from uh, black and white, like just two-tone images. And we're looking at those as well. And they do seem to have slightly different uh, behavior when it comes to feature gain. Um, yeah, but they do also, uh, they even when you recognize the image, they have, I would say, they have a much stronger effect in the lower visual areas. Mm -hmm. Because those images are really hard and they're really different from the original image. Like blurred images are quite close to the original one. So even if you are not seeing what's in the image, your representations are not going to be very far from the original one. But for occluded image or for Mooney images, the actual full scale colored image is very different from this two tone uh, image. So if we, when, when you recognize what's in the image, there's gonna be a very big uh, effect. Yeah, I think actually this is very interesting, the, is the use of Mooney images, because it speaks of what, like a, a very controversial uh, aspect now in deep neural networks uh, versus human vision, which is like shape bias and texture bias. So there have been a lot of papers now mm -hmm. that try to say deep neural networks are texture biased. They just look at local evidence. They don't see the global shapes, the holistic representation of an image versus humans, which, so Mooney images is basically an evidence for shape bias in humans, right? Like. We, we can see a cat regardless of the medium, regardless of, of. Yeah, I'm actually, I don't know exact, I haven't tested the newer uh, DNNs, but I remember AlexNet just fails with many images. Uh, yeah, I, I think the new ones are, would also fail in, 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 on many images. Like it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very hard, yeah. It's a different domain, different uh, range of even the, values yeah i remember yeah. i used to get only spider web uh, classification <laughs> targets just because it's black and white <laughs> yeah like i had also like some still like i i had like a small data set of uh, animals like also silhouette images and i tried with different neural networks it just never gets it right it's mostly like panda for example because of the black white contrast or something like this so ah so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Like uh, I, would, I would love to read about this soon when you finished <laughs> with this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we can wrap it up now or yeah. Okay, so we, I would like to thank Mohammed again for being here with us and giving us this amazing talk. It's really insightful. And yeah, thank you all for coming and yeah, hope to see you again in the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you thank everyone. You. Bye.